reading the Word of God from uh, chapter 45, verse 1 to 5. Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 1 to 5. This is the holy and inerrant word of God. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch, you said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I am breaking down, and what I have planted I am plucking up. That is, the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not, for behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord, but I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. Amen. Let me say a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Lord, we thankfully come before your presence, preparing our hearts to receive your holy and inerrant word that gives life to us. O Holy Spirit, may you work in us that our hearts would be open to the very message that you are giving us today. Let your revelation be clear to us and let our hearts be responsive to you. Flowers fade and grass withers, but your word endures forever. And this is the very word, the eternal word of yours that we are receiving at this moment. So help us that we may be able to grasp it. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Is there a way to make this mic a little bit less howling? I think there's a lot of revolving. Uh, Okay, Uh, today's passage is quite unique uh, and refreshing at the same time in several ways. I mean, Jeremiah chapter 45 is the shortest chapter, if you haven't noticed it yet, in the entire book. I mean, it only has four, uh, five verses, right? A brief respite in a book filled with lengthy and weighty material. But what makes this chapter truly stand out is that it brings Baruch, this guy, this Jeremiah's scribe, uh, into the spotlight for the first and probably the only time in the entire book. It's a bit like, you know, when the first uh, Puss in Boots movie came out. Any of you guys know that, have seen, watched that movie? (laughs) Um, It's a spinoff from Shrek. And at first, uh, I thought, really? A whole movie about a sidekick? But it turned out to be surprisingly, you know, refreshing and also quite successful, right? In a similar way, this chapter feels like Baruch in Boots, a spinoff from the main story of Jeremiah. What's even more refreshing is that by focusing on this guy, Baruch, the supporting character, this chapter brings to the surface things we might otherwise outlook. Baruch is someone we can relate to more more easily than Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah is the great weeping prophet, isn't he? Jeremiah's towering presence can feel a little bit daunting at times to us, but Baruch, he feels like you know, someone we can actually talk to, right? Like confiding in the secretary when the boss feels a little bit too intimidating. The role this chapter plays is also unique. In ancient manuscripts, scribal notes often provided insights into how a book was produced, how it came about. And this chapter, Jeremiah 45, serves as a kind of a scribal note or appendix, should you say, especially connected to Jeremiah chapter 36, if you guys remember what happened then, uh, where Baruch wrote down Jeremiah's prophecies. Now, it gives us a glimpse behind the scenes, showing us not just what Baruch was going through, but also what God was doing. Today, 
we'll explore these two key aspects. Uh, one, Baruch's own struggles, and two, God's response to them. Now let's dive into what this short yet profound chapter has to teach us. Now, like most scribal notes, this chapter, chapter 45, begins by recording the time when the scroll was written. So take a look at the first verse. It says, The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch the son of Neriah when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now, this takes us back to Jeremiah 36, as I mentioned, where these events originally took place. In the fourth year of King Jehoiakim's reign, what happened was Je Jeremiah instructed Baruch to write down God's words on a scroll as he was dictating it. Since Jeremiah himself was banned from, it, from entering the temple, most likely due to his unpleasant or unpopular prophecies of judgment, he sent Baruch in his place to deliver God's message to the leaders. And Baruch did as he was told, reading the scroll in the temple. Now, some leaders took the warning seriously enough to bring the scroll to King Jehoiakim, but unfortunately, the king himself, you know, his reaction was far from positive. In, act, in an act of blatant defiance, Jehoiakim cut the scroll into pieces and burned it in the fire. This forced Baruch to start over, all over again, writing down God's word again, writing another version of the scroll of Jeremiah's dictation. Now, what I appreciate a lot about this passage, this chapter, is how it carefully describes the struggles of this relatively hidden servant of God. Now, Jeremiah chapter 45, in verse 3, it says, You said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. What we see here is Baruch is in utter despair, mourning with sorrow and pain. He is so weary from his groaning that he finds no rest at all. Now, some might wonder why Baruch sounds so depressed. After all, he's not the one, he's not the one directly receiving God's message. He's not Jeremiah, right? He's not receiving the message of judgment. He can under, we, well, I mean, we can understand why Jeremiah, who once in chapter 20 was so frustrated, so depressed that he cursed the day of his own birth, um, we can understand why he might feel overwhelmed. But Baruch, he's different. He's just a scribe doing his job, isn't he? But we must not forget that being a scribe of God's word is not just any ordinary task. Baruch was engaged in a team ministry, if we were to call it, with Jeremiah, recording the very word of God on the scroll. And this was a spiritual task that carried significant weight, just as Jeremiah was stressed by preaching God's judgment to the nations. Baruch was burdened by writing those same messages down. What made it even more difficult for Baruch was seeing how people were responding, or to be more precise, how people were unresponsive. You know, they were even though they were in this urgent situation where God's judgment was due, they weren't reacting to the word of God. It must have been deeply discouraging and painful for him to witness his own people, his own people being rebellious and refusing to heed a message on which their lives depended. And to make matters worse, hearing that the scroll he had painstakingly, painstakingly written and delivered was burned by King Jehoiakim must have been a traumatic experience. Now, many of us um, know the frustration of losing a nearly finished document or some kind of project that you've been working on a computer, and then the computer crashes, only to realize we hadn't saved a single copy. Now, that alone can be stressful. 
Now imagine someone deliberately destroying the one and only hard copy of document you spent an entire year working on it. It's easy to see why Baruch was so deeply affected. Now we don't know. We don't know exactly because it's not clearly mentioned in our passage. We don't know every detail of Baruch's situation. But we can certainly relate to the weariness that often accompanies serving in God's ministry like Baruch. This is not something new to us. We've all seen or heard of pastors or elders or small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, and people serving in the kitchen to provide meals getting burnt out. Many of us can identify with Baruch in this scene, but here's the question. How often do we truly consider the struggles of our brothers and sisters in ministry that they are facing? How much do we actually know about their painful groaning and their sleepless nights? How much do we know? Are we mindful of their frustration and despair? Now, as Baruch faced his own struggles, how did God respond? His response can be summed up in three powerful ways. God listens, God mourns, and God saves. So he listens, he mourns, and he saves. Now let's start with God listens. Notice how Baruch's groaning is recorded in today's passage. It wasn't Baruch's writing down his own word. It wasn't that. It was God, through the mouth of Jeremiah, recounting what Baruch had said. So God is reminding Baruch what he has said without noticing anyone was listening. Take a look at verse 2 and 3. It says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. So this is a message that God is sending through Jeremiah to Baruch. And he says, You said, you said, Baruch, you said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Do you see what's happening here? The words that Baruch uttered in his despair, just thinking no one is paying attention to him, were carefully heard by God himself. Now, brothers and sisters, how often do we truly listen to those we love? I mean, our spouse, our child, our parent, or our close friends. I mean, we do listen because we're always spending time with them. But when do you actually, really listen to them? Last week, my wife, Injun, and I celebrated our 11th wedding anniversary. And over these years, I've come to deeply appreciate what a good listener she's been. I'm usually the one who listens, says that listens, but forget about so many things, but even the things that I mention in passing, she remembers and acts upon it. So if I say in the morning, oh, the weather looks like maybe it's a good time for uh, some broth, then even if I didn't mean that, I didn't mean for her to prepare it. And when I come back from church, uh, often the time, uh, that would be what's prepared on the table. And there's nothing more comforting than knowing someone truly and really listens to what you say. Now, consider this. How much more powerful is it when the one, the one who listens to what you are saying, even when you do not notice it, is the Almighty God? As Christians, we have this incredible blessing, incredible privilege that no one in this world that does not know God, know about it. Our Father in heaven listens to us every single word that we spit out, even accidentally. He listens. There's nothing more comforting than the fact that our Lord, 
who reigns over the whole universe, who controls all things, and who is the creator of us, listens to us. Now think of the story of Bartimaeus. As Jesus was on his way to Jericho, surrounded by a great crowd, Bartimaeus, who was blind, he cried out, Lord, have mercy on me, son of David. Well, no matter how loud he cried out, in the midst of the noise uh, and commotion, he probably wasn't heard. Probably nobody noticed that he was crying out. Bartimaeus could have easily been ignored, but Jesus, at that moment, he heard it. And he rebukes everyone. He rebukes the, cla- the crowd to be silent, and he calls Bartimaeus over and restores his sight. Now, friends, our Lord listens to our cries, no matter how much we feel like we are alone. And you all know, we all have those moments when we feel like not even God listening to my struggles. He doesn't know about me. But even at that moment, our Lord, no matter how faint and overshadowed my voice is, he is listening. Now, the second point, well, God listens, but he also mourns. Let me tell you what I mean by this. Now, one of the things that likely troubled Baruch deeply at this moment was the feeling that he and Jeremiah were the only ones mourning over this situation. What kind of situation? The situation of the people of God, his family, his friends, not being repentant to God, even when there was this message of judgment that was trying to warn them, this is a time you turn to God, but no one listens. And Elijah had a similar experience, if we remember it, when he fled from Jezebel, who sought to kill him. And the people of Israel were rejecting God's word and killing all his prophets. Elijah cries out to God, the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, I, even I only, I am left. And they seek my life to take it away. You see what's going on here, right? Like Elijah, Baruch was having that moment where he was feeling he is the only one left mourning for the heart of God, for the purpose of God, for his kingdom. And how does God respond? In response, God does something very remarkable. He reveals himself as the sovereign God over all things and lets Baruch know that if anyone is mourning deeply, it is God himself. Take a look at verse 4. It says, Thus shall you say to him, this is God's message, Um, telling Jeremiah to say to Baruch, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I am breaking down, and what I have planted, I am plucking up. That is the whole land. Now this verse is a reminder of what God promised at the beginning of this book. If you remember chapter 1, when he called Jeremiah to be his prophet, to be in this prophetic ministry, he was calling him to this ministry and he made it clear that he's the one who is going to be uh, building and breaking down, planting and plucking up. And God told Jeremiah that he would use him, Jeremiah, as his mouthpiece. Again, we want to pay attention to um, verse 4 where he says, He talks about plucking up and breaking down, building and planting. But notice what God says here. He says, what I have built, I am breaking down. And what I have planted, I am plucking up. It's like undoing something you've spent so much time and so much effort creating. Now, as many of you guys know, I once was a student majoring in architecture, and I used to build 
a lot of physical models for every design project that I did. And, you know, what you do is you put countless hours into making it as a neat and very precise model, as precise as possible, reflecting your vision in that small little piece of model. Typically, you keep these models because of the time and effort you spent and you invested in this model. But as time passes, what happens is you realize you have to dispose of them, um, either because they're falling apart or you simply don't have enough space at your room, in your room. So people just throw them out, and others, um, they destroy them or even burn them as some kind of a ritual. Um, I used to just break them into pieces, and oh boy, um, you know, you don't, you don't notice it until that moment of actually demolishing it comes. You know, destroying something you've created with so much care and so much effort, it doesn't really feel good at all. You know, there's a sense of pain. There's a sense of emptiness as you do it. And if dismantling a design project that never even got built as a real building can be so disheartening, how much more? How much more difficult is it for God when he has to pluck up and break down what he himself has planted and created with his good purpose? Think about it. No doubt, God was mourning as he was doing this. As a time came for him to bring judgment upon Judah and his people, this reminds us of the very moment when Jesus approached Jerusalem and he looked at the city of Jerusalem and what he did was he wept. As Luke chapter 19 says, Records it, it says, and, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on, hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. As Jesus was saying this, he did not shed mere silent tears, not just one or two, one or two drops of tears. He wept with deep heartbreaking, heart-wrenching sobs. His anguish stemmed from foreseeing Jerusalem's impending destruction. A city designed as a beacon of worship reduced to a den of sin and idolatry. Through Jesus, we see the aching heart, the heart of despair of God when we sin against him. When we turn ourselves against him, God mourns. And there is a profound comfort in shared mourning, as you know. Um, you probably know from uh, your own experience being in a funeral or memorial service, you know, not that the number matters, um, but just having someone who could mourn with you, that itself means a lot. Now, knowing that God himself mourns alongside us offers incomparable solace beyond words. For Baruch, recognizing that the sovereign Lord mourned deeply over the impending judgment of his people that he himself created, you know, it must have brought Baruch both humility and also consolation, you know, leading him probably to a deeper praise, wanting to worship God who mourns for me, who understands the situation better than anyone else and who would not spare his own tears as 
He is looking at us. Now, what is most astonishing is the third one. What does God do? God saves. Um, As you read today's passage, uh, what you find very mind-blowing is probably the most mind-blowing verse is verse 5. Out of nowhere, suddenly, God seems to be challenging Baruch with this question. And do you see great things for yourself? I mean, at first, this seems like an odd time for such a question, right? I mean, you're like, really? God? I don't know. Is this the right time to bring this up? No, Baruch is clearly in despair. And, you know, it might feel jarring for God to point out his shortcomings. And that's the last thing you want to hear from God, right? When you are going through such deep despair. But let's not be too quick to assume, you know, we know better than God. When is the perfect timing? There's always a purpose, and there's always that perfect timing of God in whatever he does. So upon closer examination, we see that there are two significant issues in Baruch's heart, and that is what God um, reveals uh, to Baruch. You know, turning against God is one thing, and then turning inwards is the other thing. Now in verse 3, Baruch exclaims, Woe is to me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. So what's happening here? Here, he's essentially blaming God for his troubles, saying that it's God's fault that he's suffering so much. He says, the Lord has added sorrow to the pain that I already have. Then, what does he do? He turns completely inward now, saying, I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Now, notice how everything revolves around I, me, my, himself, a self-centered perspective that can often accompany despair. We are all very familiar with this. However, this is not just a symptom of depression. It's the sign of a sinner who has lost sight of God. Isn't this what we see all around us? A world that is obsessed with building personal kingdoms where each person is the center of their own universe. That's what this world tries to teach us, and that's what it tries to make us pursue. Our own kingdom, our own universe, centered around us. Me, my, I, this is all that matters. And this kind of self-centeredness, a sinful self-centeredness, is dangerous because it can even taint our efforts to serve God. This is why God confronts Baruch at this time. Now, Baruch might have thought he was sacrificing his life by serving as Jeremiah's scribe. I mean, given his background uh, as well-educated men with powerful connections, Baruch might have thought, you know, he deserves something more, something more than just being a scribe. He deserves more recognition. Maybe even more than Jeremiah. Maybe he himself should be the prophet. Then he would do a much better job than just weeping. But what becomes clear here is that despite his involvement in ministry, Baruch was seeking greater things for himself. Not for God, but for himself. That is what's written in verse 5 as God confronts him. He says, do you seek great things for yourself? Now, church, this is a danger we all face. Uh, We often do, how, how often do we pursue our own private goals under the guise of doing it for God's glory? Yes, we say it's for God's glory, but how often are our hearts filled with our own 
private goals. We're so prone to letting ungodly ambition take over when we should be seeking first the kingdom of God and his own righteousness. And it's shocking how similar we can be to those who do not know God at all when this moment comes. Especially at this moment when everything is turning inwards and you are turning your back against God. You call yourself a Christian, but you find yourself nothing different, seemingly, based on what you do from the people of this world. Without God's intervention, we would continue down this path. That is what the scripture teaches us. Destined for his righteousness, his righteous judgment. So if we are to continue on this track, if we just do the way we do, then there's nothing but God's judgment upon us. As Romans chapter 3 teaches us, no sinner seeks God. No sinner wants to know about God. It is rather natural that we would seek something else, which we call idolatry, rather than seek God. And that's why God confronts at this moment, confronts Baruch. And this is the perfect timing because he saw that idolatrous heart in him. And he reveals that and corrects this ungodly ambition of Baruch. Now, Jesus even takes this a step further. If you remember, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus calls all of us to a life of self-denial and a life of service to others, to people around us, our brothers and sisters, following the path of the cross. Now, what's remarkable about gospel, the gospel is that it does not stop at correction. Now, God's word to Baruch are not merely preventative words. They are also redemptive. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts, and all that matters is whether you are able to successfully accomplish it, and if you fail, there is no good for you. But this is different. They are redemptive. In verse 5, God says, Seek them not, for behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh. And this is what God declares. Um, He says, I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. So after commanding Baruch to abandon his selfish ambitions, which brings that final judgment that God declares here, bringing disaster upon all flesh, the final judgment that is due all human beings under sin. What happens here is God immediately assures Baruch of his salvation. Now, this doesn't make sense, right? Baruch didn't even get to do anything. Though judgment is coming upon all flesh because of sin, still, somehow, when Baruch has done nothing, God spares Baruch. And this is how God saves us. It is not as a result of what we've done well, but it is a result of God's good will. His salvation precedes our obedience. And even before we could lift a finger to deal with our sinfulness, God has chosen us and carries us through his plan of salvation. To all whom he called, he provides that justification. He brings that sanctification. He brings us to that final glory of being with the Lord forever. And this is why Romans 8 triumphantly declares that nothing can be separated Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Through his son Jesus, God has paid the price for our selfish ambitions and calls us to go out 
not staying inward, but go out. Because God has already completed the work in us. It is time for us to go outside of myself and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, I truly pray and hope that you would walk confidently in this assurance of this salvation, living as a citizen of God's kingdom in this world. The situation that you are facing, like what Baruch was facing, may seem daunting, but God is listening to you. He not only listens, he mourns. Even before you started mourning, he knows of your situation. And what he does, he saves you out of that situation. And that is the gospel that we need to be exposed every day, every night. So I pray that throughout this coming six days, you will be constantly holding on to this message of the good news as you walk along in this world, no matter what hardship you face. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we gladly lift up um, our whole situation, our whole lives to you.